Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Before we get started, I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for helping spread the word about the show. Every time that you tell someone about it, or about an episode that's been helpful for you, whether in person or through email, Facebook, Twitter, however you choose to share, it helps create a ripple effect, changing more and more lives by getting this information about how to have conscious, growth-oriented, healthy, thriving, amazing relationships into the hands of more and more people. This show couldn't reach so many people without your help. So thank you for doing your part, and if you don't mind, please do keep sharing. And if you haven't yet, what are you waiting for? Please take a moment and let your friends know. So, on our show, we've talked a lot about getting triggered. But what does it even mean to get triggered? And why do we hold trauma in our bodies, and how do we move through it so that we can live more freely, be more fully alive and present for what life is bringing us in the moment? And if you're in a relationship, how can you and your partner help each other heal, either the traumas of the past or the inevitable traumas that we cause each other? Today's guest is Dr. Peter Levine, one of the world's foremost experts on trauma and author of many books on the topic, including Waking the Tiger, Trauma and Memory, and Healing Trauma, a book that guides you through a process for healing your triggers and trauma all on your own. He is also the creator of Somatic Experiencing, one of the most effective ways of dealing with the effects of trauma and releasing trauma from the body, with thousands of trained practitioners all over the world. In today's episode, you're going to not only learn how your body holds trauma and triggers, but also get some guidance into how you can, in the moment, come back into balance and actually allow yourself to fully move through whatever is stored in your body. We talk about how we can help each other in relationship, and we also chat a bit about how to apply Peter's work with children. We're going to discover and cover a lot of ground in the next 40 minutes, and we're also doing two giveaways this episode. If you want to qualify for a free copy of either Healing Trauma or Trauma and Memory, download the detailed show guide at neilsatin.com slash trauma or text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Dr. Peter Levine, thank you so much for being here with us today on Relationship Alive. Yeah, gladly, uh, gladly. I enjoyed the last conversation that we all had. And I think what you just said is really, it's exactly about that, how the past lives in us in ways that we are unaware and that get triggered by, usually by something, there's usually some kind of a trigger, although when we've had a lot of trauma, we always, we still experience ourselves in an unsettled way and we feel overwhelmed easily and, 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 and anxious and so forth. But what, what happens is that these imprints of things that have happened to us can be years, decades earlier where we were overwhelmed or betrayed. The parents didn't respect our dignity or we were left alone or there was yelling and fighting and alcohol and so forth. And it was like a war zone. Well, all of those things live in us. The question is, how do they live? And that's one of the topics, that's really the main to topic I took to open and explore in uh, trauma and memory. Because memory, uh, there are two basic forms of memory. Memories that are implicit, uh, explicit and those that are implicit. The explicit memories are the ones that we normally think about as memory. So I remember I'm supposed to get on Skype with you at 1 o'clock on this Thursday and I get there, I go to the store, and I have a list in my mind of what I need. Well, that's declarative memory. It's completely conscious. It has no emotional content. But then there are uh, memories that are deeper than that, but they're also, they're also considered explicit, but they're deeper. They have more feeling textures to them, and these are so-called episodic memories. When, you know, we're just sitting looking out in the ocean or 
in a fire, and all of a sudden we have images from other times, usually from images in our childhood. You know, this was the famous uh, Madeline in Proust's uh, novel, Remembrance of Things Past where he dipped a little pastry, a madeleine, into a cup of tea, and all of a sudden he was transported to the streets of Belfast and to the neighborhoods that he knew and to his family. And these are, these are sort of, you could say, like vignette memories that represent a part of our lives. Then underneath that, or m- deeper than that, are the implicit memories, and one type of memory is called emotional memory. So we're with somebody and all of a sudden we're fearful or angry. And to somebody observing from the outside, you wonder what happened. The person might have just made a remark that nobody else would have taken you know, any issue to. And then the person who, who we're close to I mean, all of a sudden, they feel like they're being threatened and so forth, and then they need to defend themselves, and then we get into a, you know, a fight. And uh, so these are the emotional memories. And now even deeper than the emotional memories are what are called procedural or body memories. And when we felt terrified, our body experience the terror physically. We experience the terror physically in our bodies. Our shoulders contract and go up toward, towards our ears. We get a knot in our belly. Our heartbeat is going fast. These are all autonomic, automatic responses that we have. And so even if we understand why we're being triggered or even the emotions of our being triggered, the procedural memories are the ones that really prime the pump and make us susceptible to reacting emotionally in situations emotionally in ways that just aren't appropriate. And so if you have a couple and both people are, have been traumatized, have trauma in their lives, and you can see how the fear and anger just escalates. In, in the book, I talk about the veracity effect. So if you're with somebody, say it's your significant other, your partner, and you have a disagreement, and one person gets really angry, and then the other person gets angry back. Well, what happens, what's happening here is that when we're feeling anger, we are programmed, our brain, our, our physiology, our neurophysiology, is programmed to believe it's true because whenever we experience an intense emotion, usually fear or anger, it's in a a situation where we're we're actually threatened or we perceive that we're threatened. And uh, so the way the brain is wired, we experience that as being real. So if, if we're feeling fear, we, 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 we try to find something that explains that fear. So if it's something that the, our partner did or didn't do or a look that we get from them, then all of a sudden, without knowing why, our body, our heartbeat starts pounding. We tighten up in our guts and our, and our shoulders, and we're ready to fight. And the more we feel that, the more it appears to be true. And so we actually believe that, the, that we're correct and our partner is incorrect, and they believe, of course, the opposite. So you can imagine you're going to get nowhere when both people are stuck in this escalating, again, what I call a veracity trap, that the more intense the emotions we feel, the more they seem true, and the more it seems true that it belongs to the person that we're with, that they're causing it. Because we're always looking to find the causation of what we're feeling, and we will attach it to almost anyone so, um, and it sounds so, like what you're saying is that so so our the the way that our responses can go deeper and escalate and escalate, and so and suddenly we're in the situation with our partner where we're like this must be all about you, and yeah. but it sounds like what you're saying is that many times, in fact maybe even most of the time it's not about the person it's about some some echo happening in our body. Exactly, exactly. And, and we don't, because it's below conscious uh, awareness, 
And the key in, in somatic experiencing and in that book CD that you mentioned is to help people learn to actually feel those reactions physically as sensations, as body sensations, because when you can do that, and only when you can do that, you can stand back and feel the tightening or feel the anger and not have to react to it. To be able to say, oh my gosh, okay, this is what I'm feeling. I wonder what my partner is feeling. So you can you go from being closed, defensive, to being open and curious. And that's a key step in, 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 in trauma recovery, really. So the opportunity that we have in relationship is vast because we have almost an infinite number of ways that we can trigger each other, provoke each other, and at the same time that we can use this as ways to heal. One thing that I've uh, tried to do with, with my partner is um, if one of us feels a, a particular emotion, so it's anger or fear or something like that, and maybe just say, okay, time out, and could you just be here and just let me take a little time to just see what's going on. So then I can come in, focus in on my bodily sense, feel the sensations, often we'll connect the sensations to an image, to a memory, and then each time we do that, we're able to more and more uncouple from those trauma-driven driven sensations and emotions and bring ourselves and the relationship back into the here and now so that we can live our life with vitality and clarity and curiosity. But we can't do that when we're stuck in the trauma response, when our procedural memories and our emotional memories are taking over. And again, that was the idea of this book, is to really show trauma and memory how these systems are structured so that we can be compassionate and intelligent in terms of our experience and the experience of our of our other. And indeed, you know, I think maybe one of the most important things in relationship, that is to say in a relationship that's growing and individuating, is that we're able to see, to perceive the other as other, not just as a projection of ourselves and our needs and our fears, but as other, to actually know another as another. And the first step in that, of course, is to begin to know ourselves. And that entails, as I was just indicating, being in touch with our reactions and by being able to move through them, something remarkable happens. And I think it could be could say that it's we, we, we open to our more authentic self, to the enduring self that goes beyond the traumas, the abuse, and so forth, and allows us to be in a current-based relationship with another person. Is that too wordy? <laughs> no, that's great. I'm, I'm wondering if you could fill us in a little bit on how your process for, for moving through those, those triggered moments, how that works and what is it based on? And I, I'm thinking about reading and healing trauma you were you were talking about like what what happens in animals and 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 how we have those same responses built into us. So could could you just briefly talk about sort of that cycle of ideally how does trauma move through the body and and why does it get stuck? Yeah. And right, that's the problem. In other words, if we can let it move through, we don't have the trauma. We can have a reaction that if we're able, if we have the support and we have somebody to help guide us, then we can move through that. And one of the things that, that caught my attention when I was developing somatic experiencing was wondering what is it, because animals in the wild, I'm talking about in nature, in the wild, uh, I think it's fair to say are rarely traumatized, even though their lives are threatened on a routine basis. And if they were traumatized, you know, but they would lose their edge for the next encounter and their escape would be less likely. So it occurred to me, okay, well, if animals didn't have a relative immunity 
to to the states of threat, they wouldn't survive, nor would the species, it, because it would, would would go extinct. So I I wondered what is it in the animals that gives them this this resilience. Uh, around this time, also, I had the opportunity to consult at NASA, Ames Laboratories, uh, where we were monitoring the, the the heart rate and brain waves and breathing and so forth that was being coming down from the astronauts as they went into uh, zero degree uh, orbit, and I so I got to see how some of these people which were very resilient, right, because they were able to. Um, to experience, I mean, it's quite a rush when you're, you know, you're lifting off in all of these G's, and then when you go into weightlessness. Mm. And they weren't all that way, but I could see that many of them were. And I really put those two observations together, and my, my first case uh, that, I, that, that really t- turned me in the direction of developing this method, um, that people, because we have the same parts of the brain as animals do, as all other mammals do, that are involved in 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 in, in self protection, in in um, defense and survival responses, we share the fight and flight response identically. We also share a reaction which is uh, actually is a shutdown, and that's really the most problematic because when our procedural memories take us to shutdown, we're unable to engage. With, an, uh, with ourselves and with another person, so um, so that's uh, that's an added uh, element where it really helps to have the other part and to say, okay, I'm here, I'm here for you. Uh, it's safe to go into whatever it is that you're sensing or feeling. But anyhow, we have the same parts of the brain involved in these uh, instinctive responses, and what is it about the animal experience? And what I was starting to discover with my clients and in observing with NASA was that we go through a cycle where we actually begin to shake uh, and tremble and that tends to go in cycles with other autonomic reactions like our hands getting cold or sweaty and then we'll notice a spontaneous deep breath and then that occurs again another wave of shaking and trembling and if we don't need to fear with it so if we have the support of the other then we can move through them just the way the animals do. So that's really my basic premise in how we, and, and then, of course, it was to develop a methodology that could not only help people, but then could be taught, because I think right at this point we have nearly 9,000 practitioners trained worldwide um, to impart these basic life skills, I call them really basic life skills, um, to um, to you know their clients and in, in one of the books as, as you mentioned that your nine year old child uh, uh, just started to read is the book that I did with a woman named Maggie Klein about trauma proofing your kids. How can we give our children the same kinds of skills to move through events that are potentially traumatizing and to to gain a greater resilience, confidence, and joy in life. So I, I think these are skills that, that I hope, and that's really why I'm focusing my attention and why I'm doing more of these like webinar things like we're doing right now, because these are skills I would like to be able to have everybody in the world use them. And boy, um, I hope it doesn't seem like hubris, but I think we'd be a lot better world, a lot safer world, a lot more compassionate world is people learn these these skills of deactivation and presence and moving through our threat responses so that we're not stuck in them. And then when we are stuck in them, to see where we're stuck, where we're stuck, to see what procedural and emotional memories have become stuck, and to know then how to touch into them and the term I use to renegotiate them, to let them complete. So if, for example, our arm was coming up to protect ourselves when, some, when a, say, uh, somebody was going to hit us and we got hit before our arms could even get up to protect ourselves, there's this incomplete response where the arm wants to get up and protect against the blow. And when that gets to execute, when it gets to complete, 
then again you get the spontane the spontaneous shaking and trembling and spontaneous full deep easy breath and I want to underscore spontaneous so so I I guess I'm maybe I'm being a little bit repetitive but I think relationship is just the ideal situation to not only have our traumas in our faces but to be allies with our significant others to come into greater uh, greater presence and aliveness and to share that joy and aliveness with e- with each other absolutely absolutely and you know my my partner and I we are we're working on a book for couples that's focused on where one or the other partner or both potentially have been affected by sexual trauma and and in our own journey we've had to use a, a lot of the tools that you describe to help us really present and stay present with each other um, on our journey and but I'm also thinking too that when it might be worth talking about when you're talking about trauma it's not necessarily always like trauma with a capital T right no no it can be all kinds of little littler things and 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 particularly ongoing stresses so if we're children or or even you know as adults if we're in a situation where there's continuing stress it eventually affects us in a way similar to trauma so for example if we're in a work situation which is very um negative and there's a lot of stress a lot of competition uh you know a lack of cooperation and mutual respect uh, well, that erodes our sense of, of, of wholeness and dignity, and that will affect the relationship. And then there are, you know, things that have happened to us, for example, where we were misunderstood and accused of doing something that we didn't do. Um, and there are other events where, you know, in a breakup, uh, where seemingly out of the blue, you know, somebody that we've invested a lot of emotional memory t- to, that all of a sudden they they withdraw. They don't want to be in the relationship. And, of course, that that triggers earlier responses that we've had as, as, as babies. But even in addition to that, that's one of those little traumas, like, which take the breath out of us, out of ourselves. Like, if we're you know, hit in the belly, really hit in the belly, we contract there. If we experience being hit by by some news or or something that, you know, uh, somebody very close to us dies or is diagnosed with a serious illness, we may get something very similar to that punch in the gut. And again, if we stay holding our gut and we stay in that kind of punched way, um, we're only going to see things as through that lens. Mm. Yes, and your book, Healing Trauma, it's it's not very long, um, but it's so jam-packed with, well, for one thing, the an outline of your, your theory about how trauma actually works and is stored in your body. And, and then, um, you know, I just want everyone listening to know that it actually takes you through a 12 phase process for experiencing exactly what Peter is talking about how how to get in touch with what trauma is doing in your body how it's affecting your sensations and working through to the to the other side um, it has an accompanying accompanying CD as well to uh, to guide you through those exercises but what one thing that I really also appreciated about the book is that there are several exercises that in that involve work with a partner or can involve work with a partner so um so perfect for for those of you who are actually in partnership right now or who have a trusted friend that could work with you on those things that's right again this is such a gift that we can give to ourselves and to each other and to ourselves to be able to see the world not as threatening or withholding or oppressing, but as a as a, a 
a, a great wondrous journey and 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 I don't mean that hopefully not in a kind of a new age way but really uh, you know if you think about it what would life be like if we didn't have our traumas or or we were able I should say to renegotiate them um, I mean to, just to imagine what that kind of life would be I think that in itself is a motivation to use to at least try some of those tools and see how they work for you and how they can work in, in relationship. And as you mentioned, I outlined that I try to make a book short, you know, succinct, uh, I, to make very concrete the 12 steps. I have no, I, I have no relationship to the AA 12 steps. And then the CD is to give people exercises, guided exercises, to uh, also re-inhabit their bodies in the present. Could we maybe take a sampler from what the process would would look like? Because I would love to offer our listeners something that they could try when, so so part of that might be um, like a, a window into, okay, how would I know this is a good moment to try this? And then the second thing might be, what do I, what do I actually do right now? Like I'm feeling really triggered, and and um, what would be a good experiment for um, our listeners um, to try? Well, I think the, the the first step, of course, is to start because you know when we've been traumatized, and especially with sexual trauma, we you know because our body has become like a harbinger of all of this distress that we do anything we can to tighten against our body or dissociate from our body because the body has become the enemy in a way. It, it, it's like we re- respond to it as though it's betrayed us. And in the, the first steps in, the, in that process is really to start to begin to befriend our bodies to you know, in the shamans would see this a little bit differently than psychologists, that we, because we've been so threatened, it's like our soul has fragmented into space. I mean, in psychology, we call that dissociation. So the first parts are to bring ourselves back a little bit gradually into our bodies, to reown a connection with our bodies. And then the the, the following steps are to use these basic skills and others to become aware of our reactions. Instead of being reactive, reflexive, we, we reflect on our sensations and our feelings and befriend them, befriend our bodies. And when we've done that, we really have done most of that journey because the rest is just a matter of catching it, you know, the next time it happens, and there will be a next time. But, you know, with time it becomes softer, it becomes easier, uh, the partners feel a deeper connection, and of course with their sexual trauma, uh, you know, that's sometimes so difficult because, for example, let's just say it's a, a heterosexual couple, and the woman was abused by an uncle or a brother or something like that. And they know that. They know that. But still, when their partner just touches them gently and strokes them, their body just completely stiffens or they, or they just, like, go out of their bodies. And um, so if we're able to safely... To not to have like the the agreement that we're not going to have intercourse, but as soon as either party feels some kind of a uh, reaction, that we just take the time to support the person to to process through and integrate those distressful sensations, and to do it step by step. You know, sometimes people think, oh, I, I need to tough it, you know, because I know why, why I'm having this problem uh, with uh, my sexuality, with intercourse, um, so I'm just going to go do it. Well, most of the time that doesn't really work. It's, you know, kind of like stiff, stiff upper lip and just plow into it. 
But if we take it slowly, step by step, and reconnect with the different sensations and what our body might have wanted to do at that time, to push away or to run away or to fight, of course, we were little, so we couldn't do that, but our bodies still have those impulses. So again, as we sort through them, they takes the sting out. And we can then, again, in this case of sexual trauma, be able to return to a, a deeper and full sexuality, not just sex, but connecting emotionally, psychologically, spiritually with the other. And uh, again, I think this comes from doing following very simple tools, which are not always so simple when you start, but they get easier and easier. They become sort of like the new habit of knowing when we're triggered and knowing how to work with those implicit memories, with those procedural body memories, so that they each time lose their fangs a little bit more and a little bit more. And then we, you know, then we find, of course, more freedom and a more uh, whole sexuality, more place than whole sexuality. So... I have two questions. The first I think I'll ask you is this. Um, one thing that was so interesting in your book, Healing Trauma, was like I never realized I've heard people, you know, we, I talk about fight, I talk about flight, and then freeze comes up. And people always say like fight, flight, freeze, like, like they just kind of all go hand in hand. But what I didn't quite understand and that you made pretty clear was that the um, the freeze response or the collapse that actually comes from being unable to flee or to fight like that that's this sort of the next thing that your body does is it just kind of that's, collapses exactly it goes into what would be uh, a uh, just a collapse we lose all of our energy we're in a state of apathy of fatigue it's a shutdown. It's literally a shutdown. And I, I have uh, various pictures from nature, for example, where a cheetah is chasing down a herd of gazelles, and then the cheetah captures one of the gazelles and starts tearing it apart. And, however, during this uh, chase, which is at 70 miles an hour, it peaks at 70 miles an hour, the uh, the the uh, the cheetah is is spent, but the hyena sees this, and then the hyena uh, pushes the, the 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 cheetah away, and then goes and starts biting on the animal, and then the cheetah comes by, and then all of a sudden you see miraculously, the gazelle twists over, and starts running, as though nothing had happened, so this collapse response, this immobility response is meant to be temporary. It fools the prey very often. The, the big problem is when we get stuck in it. And the thing that keeps us stuck is fear. The immobility itself, again, is just a physical sensation. It feels like I'm paralyzed. It feels like I can't move. And then I might say, is there any part of your body that feels even the smallest amount that it could begin to move? Oh, my fingertips. So just noticing that and then noticing how that spreads. And then, so because we don't have the fear that's reinforcing the immobility, we begin to come out of the immobility, which is normally time limited. But it's in default mode when our fight and flight is not successful or we find we're just completely overwhelmed. Sometimes that happens actually when we're exposed to um, to uh, blood and injury. We just immediately lose our you know our, uh, our 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 belly drops out from under us. And even and doctors when they you know medical schools when they're starting to uh, students when they're starting to learn this, they have to learn to somehow get through this reaction. Uh, so it's it's very innervating. It, in other words, it, it, it takes us of our energy. It feels like we can't act. It's perceived as a helplessness. But again, once we're able to contact it, and the way we can 
have less fear is if we're with somebody who is at our side, at our back. Somebody that we trust, it's much, much easier to go through these sensations and come out of them. Because again, as horrible as the immobility feels, as paralyzing and helpless as it feels, when we actually contact it, we move through it. And how do we know if on the other side of it, we we want to like simulate some sort of flight response or a fight response? Because I noticed in your exercises, there are exercises that are meant to to give your body that experience of of fighting and same of um, of fleeing as well. How would you know which is appropriate? Um, well, your body knows. Our bodies are unbelievably, I mean, our minds are clever, but our bodies are wise. And our bodies know what to do because they're instinctive, just as the way the animals know what to do. Um, and again, it's a combination often of um, of finding what our bodies had wanted to do so we can bring some of the energy and power back, but at the same time also having compassion for that child who was not able to fend off the adults because the adults are so much bigger. So it's kind of like a combination of feeling the instincts that wanted to protect you and also having understanding and compassion that as a child you were overwhelmed because children are so small and adults are so big. Yeah, and I mean, I even see that in my own son when when he gets really angry and like he can be overtaken by that anger and and not really have an appropriate vehicle for, for expressing that in his body. So that can lead to collapse in him. And like I see that happening. And I, you know, I kind of want to just maybe give some ideas is, you know, when a child's feeling anger, sometimes it helps to draw the anger. Uh, and what's most important is to say, okay, you know, I, I see you're really angry. And what I'm really, and I, I have uh, pictures of this in the, in the Healing Trauma book CD. You give them your hands so that they can push your hands and you can l- let them direct this energy into your hands and give them enough resistance so that they have, they have to feel their strength as they move your hands. So to get them focused on the anger, not just expressing it as a temper tantrum, but dire- directing it towards what I call healthy aggression. Because again, most of us, most children, find it difficult to deal with anger in a way because the parents have difficulties in dealing with anger. Um, And sometimes we try to reason with a two-year-old, who's crazy then? (laughs) Uh, Instead of just giving them some way to direct their anger so that they feel it as as power. Yeah, that's that's great. I'm definitely going to try the hand pushing with my son. And maybe maybe with my partner as well. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's a thing to do with partners. I'm sorry I didn't mention it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That, and keep an eye contact when, when we do that so we can allow the aggression to come out and the other one to just receive it and not react to it. But you have to have get, develop a certain amount of distance so you know that you, you, can, you can tolerate that without being reactive. But that can be tremendously beneficial because if, if, we, if we put the lid on our anger, we're putting the lid on all of our feelings, especially our passion. Yeah. So if we learn to direct the anger, we will feel more passionate. We will feel more alive. Yeah, and that's, you know, uh, the wellspring of successful relationship is actually having access to that life force in all exactly. respects. Exactly, and celebrating it. Yeah. Celebrating it together. So, Peter, I'm, I want to just say, you were talking earlier about gifts and... Um, and before we go, I want to make sure I mention to everyone listening that Peter has generously offered a free copy of Healing Trauma, which is his book, Through Sounds True. Um, and he has also offered to another lucky listener 
a free copy of Trauma and Memory. So um, two opportunities to get a free signed copy of a book by Peter Levine. Um, all you have to do is download the show guide at neilsatin.com slash trauma, T-R-A-U-M-A. Or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions to qualify. So, Peter, thank you so much for your generosity with those offers. You bet. And I, and I want to mention, too, just in case it wasn't clear, that um, Peter developed the work Somatic Experiencing, which is a facilitated way of moving through trauma. And he mentioned earlier there are over 9,000 people who are trained in that modality. So the odds are good that there's someone local to you who knows how to do that. And so I definitely right. recommend checking that out. Um, the website trauma uh, traumahealing.org. And there are, there are a section, you click on it, and you can find a practitioner in your area. It's Great. real easy, and they, they say a little bit about themselves, their background, their training, how they see therapy and healing. Great. And for those of you who are feeling called, there are also trainings in somatic experiencing, so you can learn how to do that as well. Correct. Absolutely correct. And it's not just for therapists, but also for physical therapists, body workers, educators, um, people in public uh, service areas, um, and so on. But they can get all that information from the Trauma Healing website. Now, I can't wait. I can't let this whole conversation go by without giving you a chance to talk about VU. Okay. This is one of the exercises that helps us connect with our visceral self, our visceral instincts. And it's really simple, and any, you can practice, and it's a wonderful thing to practice together as couples. You take a deep, full, easy breath, an easy, full breath, and then the exhale, you make a sound woo, V-O-O-O, and you make it as though it's coming, or you direct it into your belly, and you just let the air and the sound go all the way out, and then just wait, trust for the next breath to come in on its own, and then repeat it two or three times. Let me demonstrate. You're welcome to join in. Great. Ooh. And I just wait for the breath to come in. Maybe that's a good note to go out with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, next time you are arguing with your partner, just suggest that you voo for a moment and see how that changes the dynamic. Together. Exactly, find, together. Get out of the trauma state, out of the shutdown state, and in present. Much better to do it that way. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today, Peter Levine, and for the gift that you're offering the world in uh, overcoming the effects of trauma and being able to live more present and alive and with that capacity to, to show up even more fully um, for yourself and in relationship. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Neil. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.